Thank you everyone. So thank you Aggie really for this opportunity to share. And it's really very nice because we see new faces. I think we have a minute, right? Yeah, it's good, good, good. Okay, so um, I have Lionel here with me. So my name is Sam. So both of us, we work in Tropical Marine Science Institute. Okay, so this is where a lot of work focus on coral restoration. So let me show you our office, okay? This is my office. <laughs> So I spend a lot of time diving, especially in Singapore waters, but also dive quite a bit in the regions, Malaysia, Indonesia, to really assess the reef, to see whether they are healthy or not, what kind of different animals interact with coral reef, um, are they suffering any threats, you know, coral bleaching, taking pictures, documenting their health. So this is a coral chart, so we're going to go into more explanation. Okay, so you see that long transect plate, right? So this is actually for us to gauge over, let's say in 100 meters. What is the substrate? Is it rock? Is it coral? Is it um, algae that's under the tape? And then every year we go back to the same area and then we assess again. Mm -hmm. So you can follow, see the trends, whether how much coral has grown, did they die, anything, or the community changes within that area. Is there any damage done? Right? So that was in Rajampat, diverse bucket list. Mm -hmm. We really have to go there one day to get that. In. And I just want to show this picture. I just came back from Tupataha, Philippines, very nice. So it's actually a marine protected area. Okay, so we know corals is actually one of the most biodiverse habitats in the world. And within, they occupy such a small space, but it can support a lot of marine animals. Okay, so they also provide us with seafood, tourism, this is where I spend all my money. I go diving <laughs> in a different place. Okay, medicine, this is interesting because I think for scientists, some of them are actually trying to find whether there's actually some compound that is useful for us. Okay, and then like some coral skeletons, some of them are quite um, dense and strong, and then they are looking to see whether that, that one can replace some form of bone grafting. Mm -hmm. And then protection as well. So for us, not so much. Singapore has a lot of money, right? But if the sea level rise, we'll just build walls, ah, the higher the better. But for our neighbours, some of them, especially those living near the coastline, for these coastal communities, Coral reef is actually very important to them. They form a natural barrier so that can help to break the way. Okay? So they also support marine life, provide them with food, shelter, and then coal. So this one here is very pretty. Do you know what is this? The type of flower. Okay. So this is actually a giant clam. Yeah, so giant clam um, is heavily poached also, right, for food and also because they are so nice. The biggest one can grow up to 1.3 meters tall, big, wide, <laughs> about this, right? And then a lot of them used to put you know, like jewelry and all, very ill, okay? And because of all these branches, they are quite complicated, so juvenile fish, they use that as a place to, to hide. Alright, and these are some of the threats, there are so many kinds of different threats, but today we'll be focusing on these three. So land reclamation, this is really one that is quite a major one in Singapore because our coastline is always expanding, right? And then you have all these machines going down, coral ditching, you know, as shown by this and highlighted by Aggie in this exhibition. Pollution as well, this is something that we see quite a lot when we are diving for work or leisurely, not only in Singapore but really globally. Alright, so this is a... Uh, mm -hmm. Time lapse. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Time lapse of how our landscape actually changes. Mm -hmm. Right, you can see how small it is and every time it just gets bigger and bigger. So when we extend into the sea, some marine habitats are also lost. Right, so over the past six decades, because of all this expansion and a lot of changes to the coastline, we have lost a lot of natural heritage. Heritage, natural habitat. <laughs> okay, like our beaches, our mangroves, our coral reef, that's along these coastlines, slowly they have been replaced by artificial structures like seawalls. Okay, so this is where we are, this was in the 1960s, and then this is where we are now. Mm -hmm. And by 2030, and then if you look at the land use plan by US, U, URA, <laughs> URA, 
Okay, you can see it's gonna get bigger and bigger. So I always joke, mm. oh, Singapore's flag is gonna be very easy to draw next time. It's a mm. nice diamond shape, right? So you can see how like all these marine spaces that we're gonna take and we're gonna change them to land. Okay, so this is an artificial structure I did. So a lot of our work with the Rhino will share how we actually uh, plant corals at this area so that we can enhance this structure. Right, so these structures are already there. What can we do to make it more uh, useful in a way? Like, can it support more marine life? Okay. Okay, so question, where are Singapore's coral? But the first question is, how many islands do we have in Singapore? You want to guess? Three? Okay, so when I go to some schools, they tell me three. <laughs> Singapore, Sentosa, and Ubina. Then the guys will tell me four, because of the Tekong. Oh. Right? So we are right, we have about 64. Okay, we have 64 islands, and our coral reef are all concentrated at the southern part. So if you ask me where's the best place to dive, it's here. The further away from development is definitely the nicest. Right? And then it's at Ami Island, so you have Pulau Hantu, this is where the divers always go. Pulau Samakau our land field, right? And then you can see it's actually quite rich marine biodiversity here as well. And then you have fringing reef around this area, Sisters Island, St. John Island, this is where we also have our marine lab. So there's an offshore lab that we have. And this is where Lionel worked there. Yeah. On the island. On the island. So we can ask you about it. Every day you have to travel to the island. Much every day. Yeah. <laughs> Many, many days. Uh, so a lot of that is good because why we have it there? Because we have a constant supply of seawater. So we can actually continue. Hi! <laughs> Be comfortable. There's some seats here if you want to. Got floor seats in Hi, hello. Oh, come here, here. I'm going to put my shoes under your chair so that so nobody trips. <laughs> Okay, thanks for joining. Okay, and then Sentosa is here, and this is the Southern Island Clusters, where um, it's also accessible to public as well, so you can actually go there and find a happy day. Okay. <laughs> okay, so this is so something that we show, right? With all these machines going down the coastline. And then this is, I can't, I don't know whether you can see, but this is because of all these big machines going down, a lot of rocks, they are all unsteady, okay, they are consolidated, so it's very shaky, not very stable, and diving in Singapore sometimes like this, it's green, you can never see me, oh right? <laughs> yeah, so that's Lionel and I think one of our buddy last time, oh yeah, I think it's pretty cool, yeah, so and the distance is like, yeah, like sometimes it's like, are you okay? <laughs> okay, so on good days, it's great, we can see straight out to the entrance, but usually maybe to this pane here, to the aircon, but then sometimes it can be really bad. It's like a five finger, that's it. Oh. Okay? But sometimes we still have to continue to do our work. Sometimes they also have to hold hand to go diving. Sometimes <laughs> we just don't go down. Yeah, often we just don't, don't go down. Don't like really <laughs> sedimentation. That's why, in a way, people always think that wow, Singapore water so green, so dirty. There's no life, mm. right? Why? Why are we still doing all this? Okay. But of course, we have good days like this. Mm. And then you can see, I think one of the question was, you know, our corals are very patchy, are they always seen as a singular colony? But sometimes you have a nice reef like this. Mm. And you can see they are of different shapes, sizes, and they're quite diverse. Okay? So then of course, my favorite thing is to find animals hiding in between or maybe the coral reef. So this one, do you know what this? Oh. That looks like a Lobster? No, no. <laughs> this one? Okay, usually you see it, right? Okay, okay cuttlefish. Oh, oh, it's a baby cuttlefish. Oh, this size is oh, about your tongue. Wow. Very, very small and very, very cute. Okay, and then you have seahorse. <laughs> Trees that also help to clean the anemones. <laughs> so there's different partnerships in the sea and sometimes we get to observe that. So I think it's really very fun to get them. Some of the corals. This one, one of the uh, photographer's favorite. Because it's so slow, so colorful. Sea slug. And you can take pictures. Okay, and this is a, um, a nudibar, sea slug. Yeah. 
And in Singapore, it's really the creator. They have the most beautiful color, and they come in different shapes and sizes. Mm -hmm. So that's why divers, when they, there's a trip going out every weekend, then they always really like to take all these mm -hmm. pictures. And then you have sharks. You do have sharks in Singapore. Oh, really? Yeah, always underneath rocks. But they're not like sharks, but they're like sharks. <laughs> 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 Small one. Mm -hmm. Okay? Oh, I like that. In such a small space, we have more than 250 hard coral species recorded uh, historically, which is really very good. So the entire uh, species in the whole world is about 800. Mm -hmm. mm, so we have really quite a lot. And then we have more than 100 reef fish species and more than 10 sharks. Very white sharks don't have uh, small and combat sharks. Okay? And there's so many things out there that we still don't know. And we, every time we go, we sometimes we also find new records in Singapore, which is quite exciting for us. Okay, so this is one of my favorite finds. Turtles. Yes. <laughs> okay, so I was swimming so close, and because of the visibility, I, I thought the whole rock was moving. Oh. And then I realized, oh, it has. Oh, it's a friend. Yeah. Okay, so you take a closer look, something interesting, and you can see there is something that's dangling here. Oh. So this is oh. actually a tag. Oh. Yeah, so it's probably tagged by some scientists to mm -hmm. see whether we can track their movement, where they go, um, how long they stay in the water, mm -hmm. you know, what's happening. And you can see from the barnacles, this turtle might be quite old already. Mm -hmm. So I've been diving in Singapore for seven, seven years, and I only see turtle underwater three times. Mm -hmm. How many times do you see? Yeah, about Yeah, this is very really rare. Mm -hmm. So I also managed to see the pink dolphins. Mm. Do, you, do you see together? See so. On Galaxia? Yeah, yeah so, so yeah. when we just nice, we're waiting for some of the guys to come up. Mm -hmm. So we have dolphins in Singapore, but they are the pink ones. So when they are young, they are grey, mm -hmm. and then when they grow older, they become pink. Oh, okay. And we saw a whole pot, mm -hmm. like, wow. and, um, fall up. Or where where, <laughs> where is St. John's? St. John's Island, um, Jetty, near that area. Okay, yeah. so that's my introduction. So now I'll just have a little time to Rhino, my colleague, so he'll talk to you about more science things. And why mm -hmm. coral matter and why what were you doing to help them? Hi, I'm Daino. Mm -hmm. So sorry it looks a bit disjointed because we are working separately on our slides and okay, I'll just combine like <laughs> <laughs> I had to change his fonts, okay? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Wow. And his back now were white. And you oh, realize no. that, <laughs> yeah. you realize that our styles are very different. Maybe speech.com next time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, so Thank if you. we if I get too too technical, uh, just stop me, just ask questions okay. or any of us. Uh, yeah, yeah, we will just uh, hopefully you don't get carried away and be too sciencey about this because I understand that uh, some of you are not divers, some of you are new mm -hmm. to marine biology. Mm -hmm. So so this is just an overview of coral reefs and the work that we do. Mm -hmm. So for our new friends who just joined us, I'm Lionel, this is Sam, we are from the Tropical Marine Science Institute. It's a research arm in in NUS that does I mean marine science. Uh, we do coral, <laughs> coral work, uh, mainly coral ecology restoration. We're trying to help uh, the degraded reefs recover. With Nemo? With Nemo. Uh, <laughs> uh, when we help the reefs recover, the Nemo also come yeah. back. Uh, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> okay, so, people ask him that all the time. <laughs> so moving on. Okay, so it's just, in, in your head, when you think of scientists, you think of like, people wearing lab coats, right? Mm -hmm. But for us, we, we don't wear lab coats, we wear wetsuits. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. so, so every time, like, if we get an interview and someone asks us to take a picture with a lab coat, we'll be like, huh? You yeah. don't have this. Mm -hmm. yeah, so instead, what we do is we do surveys of reefs. Mm -hmm. Surveying reefs allows us to know how healthy reefs are, but you want to do it in a way to quantify it. So you can't say, uh, this reef is better than the reef. You, you want to give uh, uh, a value to it. Like this reef has a certain percentage of corals more than another reef. Uh, and this translates to something more objective that people can plan with. So how do we do the, how do we make it more objective? We use things like a tape measure. So we basically drag a tape across the reef and then we record all the, uh, all the animals under it. And we do this, uh, like this over the reef. Uh, we also do this also, when the reefs are not so healthy, so you all know of coral bleaching, when the corals lose their, their symbiotic algae, they turn white. Uh, you want to know how bad the situation is, then you do a survey with the tape, and then you are able to quantify how much bleaching there is. We also uh, 
do work in built up areas like marinas. Mm -hmm. So if you walk along marinas like 1 degree 15 or Keppel and you look over the pontoons, you see some of them, actually there are a lot of corals there. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, and sometimes every year we have uh, a major a mass spawning event. Uh, this is when all the corals give up their eggs. It's around April, around Easter period. Mm -hmm. So we, before that happens, we go and survey the corals to see whether they are you know, pregnant or not, whether their eggs are ripe or not. So pregnant meaning the eggs are pinkish in color, meaning they are ready, ripe to go off really. So when it happens, it, it's like reverse snow. Instead of coming down, it's going up. Okay, so that's surveying. We also do, oh yeah, right, oh, culturing. <laughs> yes, culture. Okay, so corals are, are corals animals or plants? Animals. We do a lot of um, helping these animals multiply, basically by two ways. One would be sexual propagation, which was what I mentioned just now, when the corals give up their eggs and sperm. Uh, we bring the coral colonies back to the lab, and this is where I'm based at, at St. John's Island National Marine Lab. So we bring the colonies up, when it's time, the corals just give out their egg bundles, and we collect the egg bundles and we mix them together. So the eggs and sperm from colony 1 would mix with colony 2, and then we get new babies from them. Mm -hmm. so, um, so they look like pink balls, less than 1 mm in size. And after some a few days, they settle on substrates. Uh, we give them like terracotta tiles or something, and then they start forming skeletons over. And this is the basis of where a new colony starts. It starts multiplying a bit, like dividing two by two, two becomes four, and so on and so forth, until it becomes a colony. So what what do we do with this? We let them grow. We you know TLC them, uh, make sure they grow very, make sure they're very healthy and they grow, and then. Eventually, you can use them for some other purposes, like research or other kinds of restoration work. So that's sexual propagation. Another one would be asexual, which is a bit like plants, where you sort of, uh, for plants, you break off saplings and then you can plant them in a pot, right? Mm -hmm. And then you grow. For corals, although they're animals, they sort of are able to be propagated that way. So what you do is to break off small fragments, glue them on a piece of substrate, and then you let it grow in the water. For us at the St. John's Island National Marine Lab, we grow them in tanks and this is one of our latest things that we do, we actually grow them on Lego bricks. Oh. Because previously we used to grow them on one or two tiers in a tank. Mm. But as you, everything in Singapore is very space limited, right? Mm. So, yeah. and we want to produce more. This is why we were exploring the use of a vertical culture system. Mm. So using these Lego bricks, we are able to string them up and uh, sort of use the entire tank more optimally. Mm. So we increase our production even more. So once the corals grow bigger, uh, we detach them from Lego bricks and then we transplant them or we use them for other, other kinds of research. Mm -hmm. So the Lego doesn't go into the sea, we reuse the Lego. Uh, two reasons, because we don't want the plastics to go back in the sea. Second would be we uh, are not so rich <laughs> and Lego is in the sea. Do you have a CSR yeah. team? Uh, you will tell them yeah. you are doing this? It's true. Yeah. 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 We, yeah. we do. Yeah. Sort of. Yeah. Yeah. And we have gotten no, donations. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, we have gotten donations from Lego. Ah. 80 kg of bricks. Ah. <laughs> no, we are hoping an 80 kg of cash, la, but. What yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's a start. <laughs> yeah, but we also get it from hobbyists who, who, who may not be playing with the bricks anymore, then they pass it to us. Okay. And we make use of them. So, what, we, what do we do when the corals grow big enough? we sort of use them to transplant. Mm -hmm. So um, transplanting would involve putting corals of a certain size out to areas that need them. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like plants, small saplings you put there, it grows into a tree, right? These ones, we, we use small fragments, we use marine epoxy to glue it on the reef. Mm -hmm. So the marine epoxy is like a, like a part A, part B kind of thing. You mix it, it cures in half an hour, and the coral sticks there and eventually grows over the marine epoxy. Uh, until it gets bigger uh, and becomes an adult. Uh, another thing that we do is artificial reefs. Uh, sometimes your reefs, the, the condition of reefs is not great. Uh, the framework is very unstable. Coral larvae that settle on it may not survive because the currents might push them around. So this is where we introduce 
stable substrate so that coral larvae can settle and grow happily. So this was in, oops. Back. Yes. <laughs> this was in the early 2000s, and probably not very clear here, but this was in the mid 2010s, mm -hmm. uh, when the artificial reefs that we put down, it's a bit like flower pots, about this high. Uh, and then you can see over time that a lot of corals are growing on them. A lot of animals are using them as homes. Mm -hmm. Fishes laying eggs on them, uh, cowries and urchins grazing on them, and even lobsters hiding beside them. Does it matter what material that thing uh, is? We use fiberglass for this, but mm -hmm. uh, the main thing is to use something that's inert, that is stable, that lasts a long time. Mm -hmm. Because you don't want to use um, biodegradable things. They, they may be biodegradable, but they might break down, yeah. and your reef might not form on it in time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so like transplantation is like the, how, how to say it, the, the, the neighbourhood is good, I'm just putting in a new house. The transplantation would be the neighbourhood is not so good, uh -huh. uh, mm -hmm. but I'm trying to kickstart it. Are you trying to kickstart yeah. it? But then the artificial reef is like, the neighbourhood is even worse. The neighbourhood more... is in shambles and okay. you're putting a house there. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully the house can Hopefully be more Hopefully people come in. Okay, so reverse broken window. Yeah. <laughs> 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 remember just now we had that big machine going down mm -hmm. and a lot of broken rock. Uh -huh. So you need something stable to keep uh -huh. stuck. Like this kind of colonization. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sort of give them, <laughs> give them, you build it and they will come. Kind of <laughs> how, how long would you need to see some kind of result? Good question. Ah, yes. <laughs> A good question, but yes. <laughs> so corals, how long, how fast do you think they grow on average a year? You measure by CM. Like, say CM. CM. Or Five. 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 Any more guesses? Okay. Five would be on the upper range. Mm -hmm. Average would be if you you know average a slow growers and a fast growers maybe about one two cm a year. Oh, so yeah. you can expect yes. that this yeah. effort is very manpower intensive, very time consuming, and you need a lot of corals out there, a lot of monitoring to make sure that whatever you plant grows into a substantial reef. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we are talking about uh, years, decades even. Wow. Oh, so if we see like corals that are huge, they're probably, probably decades or even centuries old. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's very easy to destroy them, but yeah. it's very hard to get them to establish and grow. Mm -hmm. But marine life also consumes them, right? Yes, uh, but not the a smaller scale than humans like destroying. Very yeah. tiny. <laughs> so this was oh yeah. Ah yeah. Oh sorry. Okay, sorry, I with you. So this was a bare seawall area where we did our restoration work. Mm -hmm. uh, not much corals on them, and then we put uh, okay. coral transplants on them. Eventually, they grew to a size that was large enough. Uh, and this took about four or five years for them to grow from about this size to about this size. This is another example. Uh, these are the faster growing ones. Uh, again, from about this size to maybe about a meter in size, wow. about four or five years. Just in time for some pretty things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a small pretty thing. Oh, you take I don't need any. Yeah. Okay, we can just. I mean, we're on a couple of sides. Okay, hello. Yeah. Moving on. Uh, so. As with all living things, they, uh, they reproduce, right? And this is our hope for our coral restoration efforts, that whatever you put down, they eventually go big enough to reproduce and then uh, have babies on their own, and the, these babies settle elsewhere and make new reefs of their own. Mm -hmm. So for this one, this is actually a three-year-old uh, three fragment. Uh, three years before, this was about this size, and then it grew to this size, and we were happy to see that it was able to reproduce, which meant that um, it was comfortable enough, and it was, it, and it's now able to contribute genetic material, so to build more reefs. Mm -hmm. So the pink things you see are actually the eggs. Mm -hmm. uh, spawning is a bit like a ripe pimple, as my colleague would say. So it, it's right, you know your ripe pimple, right? <laughs> it's at the tip, then when it, when it comes out, it's like, it just close to the surface. Yeah, it does. 
There's no nice way of putting this. <laughs> but so this is the video of the spawn coming up from the three-year-old transplant. So spawning usually happens at night, so that's why you see the background is dark. And you see the the eggs have a lot of fat inside them. So that's why when they come out they are able to float on the surface. Then what's the sound? This sound is just a different <laughs> Yes. So some so they are very fat which means they are very nutritious. Yeah. So they are fishes that come by during spawning to eat the eggs. Is there a reason oh, why but the smaller ones are just a different egg from a different coral? The smaller ones like this? Yeah. These are uh, zooplankton swimming around or pieces of sediment floating around. Okay. Is there a reason why it happens at night? Uh some say it depends on the pews of the moon, some say it depends on the temperature fluctuation. So there's no exact uh, answer yet. artificial reefs just now. Mm -hmm. So those were small artificial reefs about our knee height. This is our one of our recent projects, it's still ongoing. Uh, this is where we put down, we meaning uh, NPAS, JTC mm -hmm. and ETF and so on. Put down artificial reefs that are 10 meters tall. Huge. Uh, just off Sisters Island Marine Park. Mm -hmm. So the idea is mm -hmm. to give uh, the corals more stable surfaces to grow yeah. and establish. So over time, we do see that the corals are actually growing, and, and in turn, as they grow, they attract more fishes to come by to colonize them. We are checking on eight <coughs> artificial reefs put in place here in late 2018. The exact location is not being shared, so that the reefs have time to grow undisturbed. About a thousand corals were transplanted here. The team is documenting their growth, but is also recording the natural arrival of corals and other marine life. This one? Yeah. Uh, this one? These are sponges, but this is the part of the structure of the 10 meter tall artificial reefs. Mm -hmm. So our work consists of monitoring the structures to see what kinds of biodiversity eventually colonizes it. Mm -hmm. So to add on, right? So this is actually very interesting because for a shipwreck, it come mm. an artificial reef. Mm. How long does it take? Mm. Fifty okay. years. Okay, like about fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> close, close. Mm. Okay. So we also want to see with an empty structure like this, uh, what is the colonization? What comes after what? Right. So you can have a lot of like biofilm, you have algae, and then when does the coral actually settle? Mm -hmm. And when will the animals come? So this is actually a good way to actually um, examine it. Yeah, so it starts from this, and eventually we hope that it becomes this or even better. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, this is why we are doing why, what we are doing, uh, because there's a lot, of coastal, a lot of human impacts, coastal development, mm -hmm. uh, not in Singapore, but places like Philippines, there's a lot of glass fishing, they throw dynamite down mm -hmm. just to get fish yeah. for their livelihoods. There's also a lot of, um, and a, a, a whole variety of human impacts huh, that you all might be familiar with. Mm -hmm. What happens is that the water becomes very unclear, very what we call turbid. Uh, corals are animals but they require sunlight to get nutrition, they photosynthesize also. Mm -hmm. So when the water is not clear, they are not able to get sufficient sunlight to get nutrition. So this affects them. Uh, in addition, the coral reefs can also become very fragmented because of all these impacts. So glass fishing definitely shatters them. Um, when sediment falls on them, it causes the structure to be a bit more uh, unstable. So, yeah, this is why we want to uh, step in uh, to do active restoration. Mm -hmm. 
because uh, leaving them to recover by themselves might be a bit too slow. You're doing work around the regions, eh? Uh, we work in Singapore mainly, but yes, we do regional stuff also. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. so, uh, in terms of bleaching, uh, you guys know what bleaching is, right? And the, cor the coral has a relationship with the algae, and the the when the heat gets too high and for too long, the al the relationship breaks down. The algae leaves the coral, and therefore the coral becomes white. So in Singapore, we've had four major events so far in 1998, 2010, 2013, and the most recent and most severe one was in 2016, where about 60 percent of our reefs were affected. So you can see that the corals are all. Uh, as you swim across the reefs, it's all white. Uh, it's very interesting, like morbidly fascinating, but also <laughs> a bit shocking. <laughs> How much came back? What percent? 60% uh, were bleached. Uh, I think mortality wise was, I can't remember, we got 30%. But eventually it came back after a year plus. So, so it can be restored? It can recover, but they need extra help no. in, in terms of restoration. So yeah, that's uh, the summary of bleaching. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. so what, what's the extra help that you give? To uh, so for us, us, in the context of restoration work, when we so grow, <laughs> apart from TLC, <laughs> <laughs> uh, when, we, when we grow corals and say something like uh, a bleaching event comes by, some mm -hmm. will die, but some others may survive. Mm -hmm. We can put our efforts on those that are uh, resistant to the stress because we know that they are more resilient to this kind of impacts. Mm -hmm. And then we propagate these particular individuals mm -hmm. to future proof against other impacts. Mm -hmm. So for the ones that got bleached in Singapore 2016, for that amount, that huge amount, what was the main cause of it? The main cause was, uh, these, these images are out on the reef. So uh, it was an El Nino year, so uh, it was, uh, the sea temperatures were very warm now mm -hmm. for a prolonged period of time. So for the most recent one, uh, So far, our reefs are not that much affected yet, so fingers crossed. This year, the water is a bit warm, and so we are monitoring it as we speak. So, sorry we came in late, but the, um, the water is pretty murky here. Is that because of the ships or because of the building of the lands? Uh, both. So the waters are murky a little bit because of coastal development. Uh, although the government does put in safeguards like you know, sediment screens at, re at a reclamation site so that the sediment doesn't mm -hmm. spill past the reclamation site. Sometimes there's a lot of dredging also because we're a port, they need to mm -hmm. keep the, the shipping lanes deep. Mm -hmm. So that stirs up stuff also. But historically our waters have never been as clear as like Maldives. Mm -hmm. uh, we are on a sedimentary like riverine system historically <coughs> like many millions of years ago. So it was never clear at all, it's just that it's more unclear now because of a lot of, because of a lot of human impact. Does the sediment screen like the entire main part of the island? Uh, depends on the scope of work. So it basically is like a curtain where you wrap it around the, the project. Did you happen to have a map of where our coral reefs are? Yes. Do no. you have it in front or subsequently? I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, they are mainly at the southern islands, fringing the southern islands oh, of Singapore. Yeah. Can I take a picture? Yeah. Sure, sure. So, so look on the website. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. so, what's, what's the game plan for TMSI? Is, is it to, have you saturated like, every place that you can? Put an artificial reef or put oh, no, no, it, it's not. Also, there's more. There's uh, more. We are still testing out different strategies. So, for example, the artificial reef thing is a uh, is a test which we are uh, we we put down eight eight such structures off Sisters Island. So, based on our observations and whatever that we record uh, over the course of this project, we will then assess whether the current design is okay. Uh, either it's, or in what parts is it lacking and then we'll feedback to the government uh, and in future if they do consider to build other things they take all, all our feedback uh, and then they, they will you know, refine their designs so that's just for artificial reefs but we also have work 
on the government transport. Is the is that what you're so the artificial reef was in collaboration with JTC, mm. which provides which provided the construction material, and it's actually recycled construction material, uh, and and parks and parks and us we provide the biological input. So it's a collaboration. So, so it's quite interesting also sometimes that, you know, our project funders sometimes are from the agencies. So let's say for the artificial refund is by JTC and Park. And then the corals that were actually transplanted on the structure itself are corals that are about to be um, They were otherwise being killed. Because, by reclamation. Yeah, they, was, they were in reclamation sites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have to save them. Put on, put it on these structures as to safeguard them so that they can continue thriving. So through that, we do experiments to see whether this method works, what kind of corals work, the winners and losers, you know, of this impact of relocating, and then the best practices that we can we can come up for this project. I'm curious to know about like um, what we can do when it comes down to cleaning um, ocean. So there's like an ocean project that. Yeah, you have all these huge trop like ships, you know, that mm. clean the ocean. Um, off they want to take plastic off the ocean, clean off the ocean. But like at the same time, doesn't that pose a risk to marine um, life and the, the coral ecosystem? I think that for your Is that something that you have considered before? Yeah, I think it depends on let's say because let's say for the ocean project, it is mm. nice, right? Because it's like a vacuum cleaner yeah. that actually sucks everything. Mm. Uh, it goes for some, but then our concern was also if it can also suck a lot of different marine animals. Mm -hmm. So if there are different layers, they can still remove, mm -hmm. you know, then, then there's a bit better. Lah. But then that's why they have so many improvements. Yeah, like the project is always getting through. funded and they're yeah, yeah. in data and right. mm -hmm. And different areas work differently. Mm -hmm. So we have to see the specific threats mm -hmm. or the, how the whole hydrodynamic move in the ocean. So there's a lot of things to consider. But that's not floats, it's mostly like at, just at the surface. No, 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 they also go a bit deeper. Oh, wow. Also to get to mm -hmm. the middle level of the room. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is it clear if you're like really far away towards like these islands, is the water a little better visibility than like St. John's or Lazarus? The further you, you just go, want to go away, away yeah. from <laughs> the Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Are, you Are, you huh? Are you a diver? Uh, no, I found that I can't free dive because my eardrum's too shaky. Oh, but I do like to, yeah, like go and take pictures. But here I tried it, Lazarus, and it's like, uh, not great. <laughs> yeah. the, the further you go from inland, the clearer the water is because yeah. there's less inputs from the land, mm -hmm. like sediment or you know when it rains. But if you compare it to like, it. I don't know, Sipadan or something, is it clear? Oh, there's no comparison. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we learn to live with it. Uh, <laughs> this is the full extent of your. So these are the, the natural reef and patchy reef site, but we're also trying to see how we can uh, work on artificial structures. So even for the seawall, even in marina, so there's something that we're actually doing. That's right. Mm. Right now we only have about 10 square kilometers of reefs. Yeah. It used to be about 30 plus square kilometers 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. Then you know coastal development. Which was all around here also. Uh, yeah, it? It's ranging part. around the island. Mm -hmm. You know when you get expand and then you lose all this natural. Yeah. But yeah, there was there was no choice in the early days because the, we had to build for the economy and the population grow. But now we are coming in with uh, and we get people who are more receptive to the need for this kind of work, restoration work. Is the goal to grow the the total area of coral reefs from, uh, what did you say now? I don't thing? think our goal is to grow the coral reefs, but to make sure that safeguard, the safeguard mm. uh, maybe improve them a bit. Because mm. we will never be able to go back to what it was 50 years ago, at least not within our lifetime. So what we're doing is to improve on the science, so that f in future someone can do it better. Mm. Yeah, like coral reef, they help us in many ways, right? So they are habitats for fish, and then with us, it's, it's like a expressway, right, to even like you see the water current. So some of them when they spawn, right, so they travel, they use us as a link to go to other regions. Mm -hmm. So they can actually distribute and receive some kind of larvae, marine animal larvae. So we don't want to break that kind of connection. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're going to do is also part of our natural heritage. You know, this is what we have now. How can we safeguard this so that it can continue to um, help us and help you know, support marine animals in the, in the future. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay.
So um, that's all science. So now I'm, I'm going into pollution, ah, which is another thing that you want to talk about. Okay. So it's nice, like you know, like how um, all these things, like we get to see some of the success, which is quite encouraging for us. Okay. So I put a picture here, lah. Remind myself that I need to speak my turn. So let's talk about pollution. So this thing here, can you tell what it is? Plastic bottles. Yeah. Okay. And sometimes when we monitor our transplants, okay, so sometimes we're very happy you see them grow very well. But these are some of the things that we come across also. And these are our transplants, unfortunately. Some of them are covered by plastic bag like this. Oh. Some of them are cut by fishing line oh. and tangled like this. Okay, so this is the marine epoxy you can still see. This is actually quite a fresh transplant. Mm -hmm. Right, so with fishing lines and branching corals especially. So there's three main forms of coral growth form. Right, mm -hmm. you have the branching, branching one. You have those that look like grain. We call them a massive. And one that looks like a plate. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then other than them being stuck on this coral transplant, you something you see something like this. It looks like algae, right? So animals that don't have good eye, they don't have good eyes like us, so they cannot really differentiate what's good, mm -hmm. what's not. So with this kind of plastic bag, okay, so when they cook to some kind of block, they might think that it's food. And then they will be taken it as food. Okay? So when I go diving and I assess the leaf, this is something that I came across and it was kind of like the last straw. Do you wanna guess what is this? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 It's like a car. Okay, let's try again. Okay? It's very big and you should have one in your house. Aircon? The same smell as something. Bigger, bigger, bigger. Huh? Yeah. Washing machine. Washing machine! Oh. Oh. Okay. Okay. Wow! Okay, wait a second, wait a second. So this whole thing here is a washing machine. I have to say, okay, it's Yeah. So I think, okay, so when we're oh, doing this oh, survey, oh, and then oh, we're oh, sure. Yeah, and then we came across this. Yeah. 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 How can this happen? Mm. You know, so we find this in uh, one of the southern islands. Mm. Uh, and after that, you can also see some of these marine fish using this as a shelter. Some things have been really grown there. Oh. So I was quite like, <gasps> you know, like the whole patch of corals, and then with this machine, machine is really smack in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and beside it, Oh, the oh, no. the yeah. Okay. So this is why I started our Singapore Re. Okay. So together with one of my colleagues, Dr. Do, so we came together and said, "Ha, we do something." Okay. So we actually brought organized the dive cleanup trip. We brought our friends along, and then we also brought people from the government along to come clean every river, see what we have. Okay. So that kickstart the first trip. And then slowly we started to build it up and then we have more outreach really to want to create platforms for different people to work together to tackle the issue of marine debris. At the same time, because a lot of people have that misconception that wow, Singapore's so dirty, cannot die, there's nothing. So while cleaning up the reef, we are actually giving them a chance to leave the soil and you can actually explore some of this marine biodiversity that we have in our own backyard. Right? And these are also some of the things that you've seen underwater. Okay? My favourite. Satin <laughs> pen, your copy thing, they think the mouth thing. I know for an umbrella at 115. This one, do you know that? Helmet. Helmet. Okay, oh, motorcycle oh. helmet. And then we got a oh. PlayStation. Oh, you found it deep in the sea? No, it's not. I don't think she heard your question. No, what? You found, have you found it before? Oh my god, no, no, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> I asked someone before and he said, oh, I found a few. Yeah. A few? No, yeah. And in the wind, there is a... Yeah, yeah. so some of my friends actually yeah. did because, I mean, they are the more commercial divers. Uh, yeah. Sometimes it's part of their job. Okay, so this is what we do. We go shopping, mm -hmm. right? We do this kind of like bags. And then this is some of the things that we actually picked up. So this one, if you can, uh, can you guess what is this? Chest. Yes, chest. Oh. Okay, metal ones, and then you can see a lot of plastic bottles and a lot of metal pieces. 
Mm. Construction, yeah. the metal pieces also construction. Of this one? Oh, this is actually from a fishing cage. Mm. You call it a boo-boo oh. trap. Mm. Mm. Yeah, sometimes when all these fishing gears, they are lost, sometimes they get dislodged and break down into smaller pieces like this. Okay, and then you have a huge crab net. I think this is what they use to trap all the crabs and usually they do it in mangrove. Mm -hmm. And then because Singapore, our sedimentation is a lot, right? And it usually get covered. Mm -hmm. So some part of it only exposed. So to pull them out. And the final thing is Kong Guan, you can see. Oh, it's only Kong Guan. Yeah, so it's quite interesting. I can't repeat them out. We try to see what is from this. The <laughs> yeah, right? I don't think you've ever seen this anymore. Oh, and oh. Oh. <laughs> so cute, right? Yeah, so minimal. Sometimes we serve them up. Yes, it's oh, 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 Okay, so because there's so a lot quite rocky, right, in Singapore Sea, so I just saw this hand sticking out. Oh, oh my god! Oh, so when we dive, it's gonna be a buddy, I'm like, buddy, buddy. Oh, hand, like, how? I mean, like, you may be a real kid, right? I really yeah. don't know. So when I pull it out, I'm like, oh my god, it's a doll! Oh. And it's those kind when you're young, right, if you put yeah. it all down, the eyes will close, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think you lost one eye, la. so it was quite freaky. I thought it was seven months and I couldn't sleep. Oh. <laughs> Thing. So when we retrieve the thing, they also will sort them out to see because the thing is we don't know what is under Singapore Sea, like mm. what kind of trash it is. So we have a data sheet that will record down uh, what kind of trash we picked up and then it's uploaded to an online portal. Mm. And everybody can access. Okay? This is a data sheet. Mm. Okay, so we want to share our data with the world. So this every little circle here is the number of marine that we picked up and recorded by the different countries. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is in this website. I can take a look. Mm -hmm. So Singapore, when we went, when we first started in twenty sixteen, we felt like it's quite quite pathetic. Now, I mean, look at everybody's numbers. It's like five or six digits. No way. Yeah, for real. So we come in, want to grab the numbers. Okay, so when we do with divers, we hopefully they want to they can carry that forward, and then they, when they go diving on their own with their friends in other countries, they can help to document as well. It's mm -hmm. very easy. To Okay, so so far we have impacted this number of divers, we got more than 11,000 trash and weigh about 26,000 kg. 2.6. Yeah. Anyway, we have about 28 baby elephants. Okay, so when we have, I mean, we work with different, um, we are very lucky, we have different organizations that want to do this with us together. So we have um, health products, you know, agencies, cosmetics, and they want to do this as kind of their CSR. So it's good when you come together. Sometimes they want to work with different people. They want to work with influencers. Okay, fine. So for say they want young people, and then of course I think a lot of them they want to get young people to really get more involved in marine conservation. Mm -hmm. And this is where they want to create different platforms for us to do it together. Okay. So I'm not sure if you have seen this article. I think it was quite recent, like one or two years back, mm -hmm. where sometimes you already know we have nine things when they are dead, lah. Right? Mm. So this turtle, when they found it right, you can see that kid is already separated from the carapace. So it's quite scary. So a group of voters saw it and they really want to do something about it. Okay? So this one, a shark, right? I haven't even seen a shark when I was diving. Mm. Right? And then we saw this trap in the net. So ghost nets are very scary. They're like a huge blanket and they just doodles everything in their way. Right? So then they catch things indiscriminately. And then this is what happens underwater. So some divers are going ask to this, like, hey, we found a ghost net, can we go and help and retrieve it? Yeah, sure. So when we see it, it was like this, and it was entangled on, on a lot of the corals and they're punching. So they are very fragile. So it took us really a lot of time to really try to disentangle. Okay, so when the net was removed, this is was the one um, that killed the turtle at Pulau Hantu. Mm -hmm. And this whole net was about 100 meters long. Wow. Yeah, and you really need the help of commercial divers, you know, with the uh, uh, what do you call it? The A-frame, the crane. Uh. You know what crane? It's a crane. Winch. 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 To pull it out, and then there's still, there's still a lot of different marine animals you know, stuck on it. So they're trying to remove that and put them back into the sea. Okay? So these are also some of the things that we also try to engage with. This was a uh, COVID baby lah, because we cannot go diving. Then we try to do things on land. We partner with Georges. This is pretty cool. So it's a dive cleanup, and then you got rewarded. You'll get rewarded with ice cream or free beer. Oh. 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 Oh.
Okay, so it happens every last Sunday of the month. So if you're interested, do sign up and take a look. So, okay, so a lot of young children actually come with their family. So this is actually quite a nice sight to see how um, they sort the trash. Ah, like, oh, very hot, I don't want to do it. Then the parents still have to do it for them. It's quite cute. Okay, so here's something that uh, we also talked about. Right, so this is Marina, 1 degree, one degree 15 Marina, where we want to try a different way how can we actually put corals back here also. So mm -hmm. not only on the islands, right, we want to try something more inland, which is quite interesting. This is a pontoon, and this is a floating one. See this structure here? It hangs on the pontoon, so it rises and falls with the tide. Mm -hmm. So the corals are always exposed. So with the same kind of um, technique that we do in Singapore waters, some of them are, uh, it, it has holes so water can hold through, sedimentation can fall through and sometimes we really have to clean and scrub. You know like gardeners like that, we do mm -hmm. every day and we take care of them. Right, and we do some planting. So after the nursery is done, we put them back in the sea together with help of the members of 1 degree 15, which is mm -hmm. nice. They want to do that, they want to get their members involved and then we we'll do it together with them. Mm -hmm. And we get the kids involved too. So different workshops and then getting the kids to explore. So this is very interesting because you don't have to dive. You can actually walk on the pontoon and see the corals itself. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a nice little coral walk along the pontoon and then you point out the different marine animals. Sometimes you see cuttlefish so big, sometimes you see octopus. And once I was very lucky, a turtle actually surfaced. Oh. Yeah, okay. And then um, through our Singapore, we also want to bring you know the ocean to the public, mm. you know, uh, whether yeah across all ages. So this is actually uh, a little young scientist talk where we mm. talk to them about what we do, what are corals, and we get a lot of funny questions. Like, Miss Sam, why does the octopus have eight legs? Where does all the fish come from? You know, it's very cute. So we really want to inspire them, you know, from a young age like this. Okay? And then uh, we go to preschool, and then we go and do a little bit of cleanup with them and the teachers. And if you remember this, yes. I worked very hard for this. Yeah. Oh. Okay? So hard. So we actually work together with Science yeah. Centre to come with a oh. list of activities so you can collect your stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you can do it now, it's very cute. And here's a Nemo. <laughs> so if you have young ones, encourage them to do it, or then you can take the batch now. Okay, so I also oh. did a talk with seniors, so this is very stressful because <laughs> I have Mandarin! Mandarin. Oh. One hour Mandarin and dialect. But it's very cute, so the thing is you get a lot of stories from them. The last time when I say this compound, I go to the sea, I see a lot of very nice coral. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you get a lot of all these things. Which is nice because when we do outreach like this, so I appreciate you know, um, Aggie also get your community here so that you can share not only to people who already know about corals. Mm -hmm. no, I, don't, I don't want to talk there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> they reach to different audience so this gives us a very nice platform to you know, talk to them. Okay, so these are some of the other scientists hard at work. <coughs> okay, so this is our team here, you know, we grow corals on seawall. Some of them, you see the seawalls, right, they are coming out of different structure and tiles. How can we modify the seawall to make it more complex, design is more complex, and at the same time, they can encourage marine animals to colonize, more biophilic. <coughs> some of them work on DNA, some of them are working on giant clams, so they can try to reintroduce them back into the sea. And then even plastic is a big thing now, right? Okay, so question. I'm not a scientist, but how can I help the marine life? So these are different ways that you can do, something that I will really highly uh, recommend everyone to use these resources, right? Our good friend here, very cute, happy, yeah. And then some of these local marine animals that you should look out for, you can learn more about, these are very, very good resources. And then some of the books, podcasts, if you want to, these are some of my favorite, this book is actually quite nice. And podcast done, done by some of these um, local communities actually. So they interview different marine scientists, you have community leaders and they talk about what they do. And these are some of these people that you can meet and connect. So if you have some time, volunteer your time, there are always things for everyone to do. So Kim Seagrass, they actually do a lot of citizen science. You go out with them, you do a lot of surveys, and then you can clean the beaches and the waterways with them. Some of them also do intertidal walk, which is very nice. Um, a nice step into this marine environment, and very kids friendly as well. Okay, so meet these people, and some of them are really, really very young, which is very encouraging. 
and bring your families out. So it's my mom. I try to bring her go diving. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and then in the Thailand walks, it's uh, very easy. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
probably help as well. Yeah, lor. I mean, ideally, uh, it should work if things are also really well taken care of and managed well, then, you know, that ideal will happen. Uh. But the thing is, we, we all know it's not the same. <laughs> <laughs> and there really need a lot of work to, to make that happen. Yeah. Yeah, that's basically another angle how you want to motivate your kids to achieve that level. And I would have a key, like, key data points and stuff that you shared, like, 1 cm is average yeah. versus 5 cm is like a great year. Mm -hmm. And it depends know? on different color species. Huh? So one of these research is actually quite cool. So then you know, when you play a game, right, different characters got different strengths. You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, so he, he also came up with a matrix. Huh? Oh. Like, of all the color species we have in Singapore, which one grow faster, which one is more um, heat tolerant, which one can be small sediment tolerant. Mm -hmm. So he has a whole matrix on that you want to share. Yeah, so in a sense, you when you run a restore area, you don't only pick species at random. Mm -hmm. You want that area to have a certain function, like maybe being more resilient to stress, um, maybe it grows faster. Mm -hmm. So you pick the candidate species that uh, that satisfy these requirements, mm -hmm. so that you get your your target. Mm -hmm. Something like that. My different people might want to. Oh, I have this whole piece of degraded um, leaf. What do I want to do? So for some people, it's like, oh, I just want the coral to grow fast. Mm -hmm. Some it's like, oh, I just want to preserve the rare ones. Or some of them, I just want to target, or in 10 years later, they'll be still able to grow because of the climate change. Mm -hmm. So there's different ones, depending on the goal of the restoration petition. Yeah, in the natural mm -hmm. world, natural selection happens. In, in nature, natural selection happens. And <coughs> when you observe that, um, when, when, you, when you're talking about, like, I don't know, curating that, is it to mimic some form of like normalcy and how the natural selection is coming from the world? Yes, in a sense, but also we are coming from the push of um, stepping in because if we don't do it, then the rate of degradation will exceed the rate of natural recovery. So, in a sense, it's a it's a very active process, uh, a very proactive process. But if you are selecting certain species, won't that reduce the diversity? Uh, yes, uh, but then the idea is to start from those species and once the community is able to establish itself, more will come in or you can put more in. The, the, the good kickstart species. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you see a lot of coastal work, I mean, because they, they only want to grow the fast growing ones, mm -hmm. but they tend to leave out those that are very useful but still grow very slowly. Mm -hmm. So because different kind of growth forms, are whether it's bunching, feeding or massive, they can host different kind of marine animals. Mm -hmm. So you want that kind of diversity. Mm -hmm. So it's like plant. If you plant all the same kind of coral species, if there's a disease, yes. one die, all die, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then I say break, breaking wave, the branching one, they go very fast. If the wave come, right, they will all get shattered. Mm -hmm. You still need some to hold that kind of um, complex structure that coral reef has. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. If you don't mind a very basic question, I see hobbyists who keep like uh, saltwater mm -hmm. aquariums. Yeah. And then they look like they have pieces of coral in them. Where did this come from? And is this they come from you? Like no, 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 no. no. <laughs> recent, recent, recent projects. Uh, I wish they come from me. So uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very big trade. That's my that's trip. my retirement is it, plan. Yeah. I mean, people. I mean, people keeping coral at home. I mean, is this like? You know, buying ivory. They buy it from a lot of aquarium yeah, shops, so it can be as cheap as. You know, not actually tens of dollars cheap. to yeah. hundreds of dollars yeah. per small fragment. But they would have been broken off from yes, some natural... Yes, and they usually get it from Indonesia or Australia. Mm -hmm. And these come in through the aquarium trade. Mm -hmm. And then they just, you know, sell at the shops now. What are our views on that? Should um, that be discouraged? It's, it's not... I mean, yes, discouraged in a sense, but it's also a, a kind of a service the ecosystem provides us. So for, for the... Where the places where they come from, uh, people also depend on harvesting these corals for their livelihoods. Mm -hmm. So the issue is whether they are over harvesting or harvesting within a, a in a sustainable manner. If they can have farms that you know propagate these corals and then they sell them, that's a bit that's that's better than harvesting directly from the wild because there's no way to, to stop over harvesting from the wild. Mm -hmm. So it, there's no easy answer whether it's good or bad. Yeah, but for Singapore, for them to be able to distribute and sell it, they should have a license. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's okay. 
can yeah they cannot. Yeah, it's it's regulated quite strictly in Singapore. Mm. But so far, how is your progress of your work? I mean, as per mm. sounds very promising, but but are, are you all making progress? I mean, on the personal standpoint, it's like since you're dedicated your your career to do this, are, are we seeing like? Good results that make you positive to continue to do, or it's more like a stamina kind. It's just oh. like you believe in this, and even you are going against the tide, you're still doing it. How how, how does it go? Yeah. I, I think now it's getting more um, optimistic because it can, we can we show we have results that the corals can grow in mm. uh, conducive area. So let's say one of our projects, the one, the BTO one, you know, for coral. BTO! <laughs> 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 yeah, why we choose that place is uh, we, put, we put them in Sisters Islands Marine Park because that place is protected. You cannot fish there, you cannot anchor there, you cannot harvest anything without any permit. Visitors, divers cannot even go there. So in that kind of protected area, corals can thrive. And then you can see a lot of marine animals using that structure. So this is actually a good point for us to push for can we have more protected area. Right, so also good the thing is like now we have a lot of um, projects, right, that get a lot, like they'll bring us into different stakeholders meetings, they'll say, hey, um, scientists, you're going to reclaim this land, you all got any views or not? Mm -hmm. So we'll come in and champion, or we'll come in and like, no, you cannot do this, this area is very sensitive, can you move to other places? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, coral spawning is around April, can you don't do your construction mm -hmm. near this so that they can have, can spawn us? So at least now they are more receptive and accepting to our uh, our opinion and our results that we have. So I think it's good. So they're only hearing, they're inviting scientists, they also have nature groups and youth coming on board in di different kind of technology mm. with the different like, you know, um, agencies <coughs> that talk about it. At least it's more open now. Mm. And we re really make sure that there, there is some kind of mitigation. Now. So I think environmental impact assessment is a big thing. Yeah. And I, we hope they, they honour it. So for the EIA is that they are the request of you. Is there like a standard body, or do you actually determine the standards of what um, is possible to do? The usually when a government agency requests for EIA to be done, they would have their their specs. Really. Yeah. Oh, okay. So they, then the contractors will do it, and then the government body itself assesses the EIA in mm -hmm. the report. But of mm -hmm. course, they also have uh, inputs. Uh, in-house inputs or inputs from elsewhere, uh, ex expert inputs to see whether the, the, the report makes sense. Can you guys? Or yeah, can come from academia yeah. uh, within themselves or so. Yeah. So like we, we definitely have seniors who, uh, who, who read these reports mm -hmm. and see whether they make sense. Like our boss, Professor Chow, who is like the pioneer of mm -hmm. reef science in Singapore, mm -hmm. um, he does a lot of this kind of work also. And according to him, last time, like maybe what, 40 years yeah. ago, government bodies were like just they, they don't bother about this kind of thing. They just do first. Yeah, they they do how, uh, this how. Yeah. <laughs> at least now we are brought from the start of discussion. I see. Which is, which is cool. But they have a section on like underwater assessment. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, 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 of course. So when they have, especially for those coastal development projects, yeah. they have to do the baseline assessment of what is there, yeah. what is the marine animal there, what kind of corals are they of different threats, what are the threats level. Mm -hmm. So if they are really like really critical, can we do something about it? It's not mandated, yeah. but increasingly it's, it's still being <laughs> it's, it's still uh, being done. Uh, so because, this is something that we're trying to push. Yeah. Yeah. What's happening with um, is it three sisters? There's one of them that's being redeveloped for like increasing like visitors, right? Is that three sisters? Oh, three sisters? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're actually doing development to make it more like a uh, natural park, <laughs> more yeah. accessible, more facilities. Yeah, so, a bit more, yeah. so to encourage more people to, to visit that and a more mm -hmm. educational components in that area. Yeah, so not just an island, but how can we enhance that kind of like, mm -hmm. value? Mm -hmm. Then this field has this global uh, community. So can you tell us a little bit about like besides you all doing this work, like how big is the global community? What do they do together? Nice. Yeah. Well, Oh, just today. Very, uh, very uh, opportune question because yeah, yeah, yeah. this week, or rather, yeah, this, this coming week, Monday to Friday, we have our Asia Pacific Coral Symposium, mm -hmm. uh, oh, which is every four years once. And anywhere is hosting it. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you don't get to travel. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, 
traveling all the time in San Francisco. Yeah, the last one was in Philippines. So wow. nice. After that, they went diving. Oh wow. Uh, in Singapore, we asked, you want to go diving? No. <laughs> Yeah, but it's good. Like this whole week, we we'll expect people from the, the agencies from different uh, Asia Pacific region, mm -hmm. even the uh, NGOs. We even work with fishermen in Bali. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they're actually coming to talk about you know nice. what they do and how they grow their reef. So I think giving empowerment to these coastal communities to come and share their work, mm -hmm. I think it's something that's really nice, and I actually look forward forward to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and students representing, so it really spans across different sectors of coral reef. That you have education as a vehicle. Mm -hmm. You have innovative tools to monitor coral. You have community work. You have scientists to fish. Mm -hmm. yeah, so this depends. The different scientists from different countries they do it, and then we come together to, to, to discuss and learn from each other mm -hmm. to see what works there, what works for us, then how, how we can make the whole situation better. Mm -hmm. Then how, as a marine scientist, how do you progress in your career? Why you like saving? Like, oh, I save like like I save two two kilometers of how does it go? How do you progress? You study, 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 when you do outreach, people finally understand where you're coming from and, and they're more conscious about their, what, what they're doing. I think it also depends on what kind of scientists you want to be. Do you yeah. want to teach next time? Do you want to do research? Like for me, I'm okay with just communicating. You know, I just want to share and educate. I want to be a bridge. So you see where you fit in. Uh. Mm. Yeah, like for this, him, he just finishes. Yeah, I'm not he actually is. asking oh, a typical no. Singaporean. <laughs> <laughs> More like curious about how, how the scientists advance themselves. No? Not a typical Singaporean you career development question. Not advanced yeah. themselves. Skills yeah. or like yeah, learning skills like we, yeah, we really learn different things. Uh, like before I started or before I started this job, we didn't really used to DIY a lot of things. But now we go to hardware shops a lot to buy stuff, you know, make all the things. I'm an engineer today. Yeah. Like, I think I'm <laughs> Like now, because technology, right, we want to see how we can use that to help monitoring. Mm -hmm. Like machine learning is something that is very tricky. Mm -hmm. But in Singapore, environment is very tricky. In other places, Indonesia, wow, clear water. So we're just talking about it. Like technology can also help them to identify and measure, you know, how much coral cover in the place. Mm -hmm. But because they have clear water, but in Singapore, it's very hard. Right? Even drones also have difficulty maneuvering. Mm. So these are something that we have to um, see how we can tackle it. Mm. Learning from other people, how they do it. And sometimes do it ourselves and just try. A lot of trial and error. Yeah. Yeah. Such a fun job. <laughs> yeah. The fun part is only diving. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's like learning and things. Yeah, one month we about five days. Mm. Three to five oh, days, wow. one month to check the corals. The rest are just fighting, which is like <laughs> oh, <laughs> data, <laughs> man, do your data. But there is like this um, group that does live streaming of dives, um, uh -huh. or like the, I mean, this is probably somewhere in the Western world, a lot of budget, but like they have live streaming mm. of um, dives. Mm. Uh, not that, not really dives. I think they just have a machine there to like capture yeah. deep water. No, what is it called? Nautilus one. I don't know. So it's a team of scientists who are actually in the submarine. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Oh and yeah, yeah. And then they will have like live, live commentary. Like, like live commentary. Oh, that's so cute. Like, and then suddenly like a random like animal appears and then you're like, what? <laughs> 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 yeah. Singapore is like, where's my buddy? <laughs> 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 are there other habitats in the world which are similar to Singapore's conditions? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Um, Hong Kong. Yeah, so yeah, we're, not, we're not unique in having this kind of environment. Yeah. Hong Kong, Jakarta. Jakarta, yeah. some kind of Malaysia. Mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. They are green, but clear. As in... Greenish. Greenish. Yeah, yeah, not blue, but also so not blue. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So also near major cities. Yeah, something like that. Like harbors, mm -hmm. more sheltered. Mm -hmm. I think he is yeah. radar. 
Like you can't drone everything because it's dirty, but why can't you use like radar to like see and like sense where the coral is? Sonar. Sonar. But there's yeah. also a lot of noise underwater. Yeah. Oh, sure, I didn't end up with something you would have bought. Sometimes in certain sites we hear like pounding. Oh my god, that's scary. What was yeah. that from? Reclamation? Oh, reclamation, yeah. But I go to the shipping, um, well, shipping uh, yes, uh, so does that affect the marine life, right? Because there's noise pollution for them also. Pollution also, like, mm -hmm. states, mm -hmm. So in Singapore at the moment, are there, like, like high and dangerous areas that you're focusing on, or...? Uh, areas, uh? Mm. Maybe it's a small area, or, or a specific... Area or reef or yeah. high risk area. You mean high, high risk, risk or, or high uh, by, by, by high high risk. risk. You know, kind of like high endangered species kind of thing. But it's not species, but more like high endangered area. Oh, oh yeah. Like that means on, like. on the high risk, yeah, any yeah, time yeah. is gonna go. So how we selected the Sister Island Marine Park? Mm. It's because like, this is uh, <laughs> a mother. We call it a mother. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We seed a lot of larvae to different parts of the region and different parts. So because of that, you protect that place. So you have that rules so you cannot fish there, you cannot do all this. Mm. So that one is, is so far. So so because by designating that, yes. that already ah. addressed the critical <laughs> critical <laughs> issue already, yeah. right? So that, that's the that's the one um, that we, it's kind of also like a pilot lah. So see how we can mm. actually manage this area. And the thing is very complicated because Singapore's water is very multi-use. Everyone wants a piece of our scene, mm. oh. right? The port, aquaculture, mm. you have the reefs, protection, recreation. recreation, diving. Sometimes I go diving, I have jet skis above my head. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. It's very scary, right? So the, I think something, this is something that we can, we can do together like, as a community. How do we make it safe for us, safe for marine animals? At the same time, it can still be Continue developing, uh, and so that's our challenge, both on land and underwater. Yeah, just just a general comment about the, the talk. Yeah, you certainly do well in communicating because you project a lot of positivity, and uh, yeah, I never expect so many questions, so we can really learn from all of you. Thank you so much, and also if you need have any resources, let us know. I'm happy to chip in.